and harassment in the Middle East, but he has written on media and informational controls, revolutionary cultural production, digital misogyny, and digital propaganda. He completed his PhD in government and international affairs at Durham University, and uh, his publications include um, Political Repression in Bahrain, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020, and Disinformation and Deception in the Middle East, uh, published with Hearst Books and Oxford University Press in 2022. Um, so I think the way it's set up, we're going to, Dr. Jones will be speaking to us for about 45 minutes, then we're gonna have 25 minutes or so of Q&A. And um, yeah. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Jones. Thank you for that introduction. And thanks, everyone, for coming to the first session. I know it's 10 AM. And I, some of you are probably still jet lagged if you've flown in from various places, especially Canada yeah, and other places. But yeah, so thanks for coming. Um, I'm Mark. And I'm going to be talking today about greenwashing and digital or sort of pro-digital dictator tweeting. Uh, which hopefully will become clear uh, as I progress through this. Um, you can see this lovely AI-generated image of me. This is how I feel <laughs> living alone in this kind of technologically repressive world. I'm very dystopian today, but I'm, I'm a very upbeat person, really. OK, so just a bit of context. I do research on digital authoritarianism. The term has different definitions, but broadly speaking, it's the use of digital technology for illiberal practices. It's not just about specific regimes. I acknowledge that authoritarianism, digital authoritarianism, is a supply chain. As I mentioned yesterday, there's a number of actors, including states, corporations, both in the global north and south, who use technology to basically engage in illiberal practices. But I tend to focus on how states and bad actors uh, use digital technology to disseminate propaganda, disinformation, but also use it for surveillance, intimidation, uh, and harassment, especially of journalists, of activists, academics, um, uh, and people who you could argue are important civil society actors. Uh, and when I say actors, I don't mean like George Clooney, although uh, after that whole Johnny Depp, Amber Heard thing, uh, there was a lot of trolling on that and bots, which is kind of strange. Um, anyway, my methods, and, and I, I, I'm going to talk a little to methods simply because it was raised yesterday, and I know it's a winter school, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get into the weeds, but I will try to, to, to mention the odd um, element of how I do these things because I think it's important. But generally speaking, I come from a very mixed method background. I'm not a compu um, computer scientist. Uh, I studied media and journalism, and then I did Arabic and history and politics. Uh, but through the course of my work focusing on repression, I became interested in techniques of media repression. And through that, I started developing techniques that I thought uh, would help or were useful in finding how media was manipulated, especially social media. And today, I, I want to talk a bit. Um, it's, it's a, the reason there's a, different, a few different topics on the table, from greenwashing to what's going on in Sudan, is because I'm focusing on a network, a particular network of accounts that I believe is linked to the United Arab Emirates um, that is engaged in tweeting about uh, various aspects related to UE foreign policy. But I'm going to start with talking about digital greenwashing. Greenwashing and anything washing, I know sometimes these terms are objectionable. But essentially, greenwashing is a term used to describe a co corporation or entity or state's selective representation of their uh, basically environmental credentials in a way that minimizes the negative impact that they're having. Right. So essentially, propaganda for the environment. And I think this is a very pertinent topic obviously because of the climate catastrophe or crisis or climate change, depending on which nomenclature you want to use. And the reason I think it's also particularly pertinent is because recently there was COP28 held in UAE, uh, which is obviously the annual summit in which countries get together to dis discuss how they're going to low in their carbon emissions. Okay, So it's a pertinent topic, and it's a topic that uh, I think is important uh, on a, an ethical level. Right? And we were talking again yesterday about what drives our research or what motivates it. And I think it's fine, uh, important. I mean, you could talk about research being politically or policy impact. But sometimes there's an overlap between policy impact and what arguably is an ethical or moral choice. Um, so synergy, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but before we go further, I would like to introduce you to someone. Georgia Vassilou. Does anyone know her? 
It'd be weird if you did, but it'd be kind of cool. Um, so no, no one knows her. Uh, she's got a, a Twitter account, as you can see here, or X account, uh, Georgia Vassy. And her bio is exploring the cosmos and unlocking its secrets. She works at the MB, uh, the Hamdan Rashid Space Center in the UAE. Uh, and she hails from the beautiful island of Cyprus. Anyone from Cyprus here? No, OK. Um, and as you can see, here's an example of one of George's tweets. Uh, the UAE has demonstrated its commitment to a sustainable future by hosting the UAE Climate Tech Forum. This event will enable industry leaders to discuss and develop innovative solutions to reduce carbon emissions and achieve a net zero future. So she's very, she has very uh, uh, positive views of the UAE's approach to climate change. And other people would agree with her. She was cited in Abu Waba, for example. Not that tweet, but something else. So as we know, in the media ecosystem these days, it's very common for newspapers to pick up what's going on on social media and use that as a vox pops to, to sort of save having to phone around and get people's opinion on things. And then you have people like Georgia Vassilou from Cyprus, who's interested in the cosmos, willing to give their opinion. I have another friend I'd like you to meet, Sadr Mohammed. You can see a photo of her standing next to what looks like a piece of wheat, or I don't know what that thing is called. Anyway, Sarah is an Iraqi based in Fajera, constantly seeking new opportunities to maximize returns and create wealth. I mean, who isn't, right? Um, and she's got Iraq Tech Adventure tanked here. OK. Sarah, uh, who's got a verified account, as you'll notice, um, has also been very positive about COP28 in the UAE, and also Sultan al Jaber who is the CEO of uh, ADNOC, which is the Abu Dhabi oil company, and also the president of COP28. OK, so she has got a lot of effusive uh, narratives here about the UAE and COP28. UAE's call for international cooperation and its commitment to being a perfect host, perfect host, uh, for COP28 is a testament to its leadership in tackling climate change. As the world's attention turns towards this crucial summit, the UAE's efforts to create a platform for meaningful, et cetera. You can see, I'm not going to read them all, but you can see here there is a clear narrative from Sada and Georgia uh, about uh, why the UAE is a good place to hold COP28 and why, despite the challenges, they're doing the right thing. And interestingly, if you'll notice, yeah, you'll just notice for the purpose of it, the hashtag Dr. Sultan al Jabr. Right? Important that they use the honorifics. Um, Sada was also cited in a number of news organizations, right? So a few of the accounts gained successes. This is called breakout. Breakout is when someone goes from social media, from that particular information ecosystem. I think the term was coined by Ben Nimmo. It goes from that information ecosystem into a larger information ecosystem, such as legacy media or, for example, influencers and maybe even you know, discussions in policy circles. Right? So you have Mashable Middle East quoting Sara Mohammed. Uh, you've got Love in Abu Dhabi. I don't think it's a particularly credible thing, but if my Instagram's anything to go by, there's like a bunch of these love in Qatar, love in Abu Dhabi uh, accounts uh, uh, that get read by a lot of people. Okay, so here they've selected again one of Sarah Mohammed's quotes about Abu Dhabi as a shining example of what can be achieved through dedication and hard work. Again, very positive. And there were many more people who had very similar biographies. Uh, generally, I would say young, attractive professionals. Uh, you've got Yal here, another Cypriot space scientist. Uh, she thinks that study and education are the genuine roots to tolerance and peace. I mean, who doesn't, right? Uh, and then you have Jen, who's exploring the latest technology and how they can be used to improve our lives currently based in Dubai, right? OK. And, and they've all got these kind of stock images of you know skylines, um, uh, some from the UAE, some others not. So they all loved the UAE's approach to climate change. But what did they hate? The Muslim Brotherhood. Now, what's going on here, right? You've got all these young urban professionals from Cyprus, uh, various other places, who for some reason also all decide that they want to tweet about Paraguay's, <laughs> Paraguay's decision uh, to classify the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist group. Okay. Right, regardless of one's thoughts about the Muslim Brotherhood, that's your opinion. It's kind of strange that all these people who, uh, some of whom have verified accounts, these young urban professionals with similar bios, are all highlighting the Paraguay's uh, opinion about the Muslim Brotherhood and also sharing the same image there. It's no surprise then that these accounts are probably fake, right? Sock puppets. 
So there are accounts who want to give the illusion of being a real person, um, but are clearly not, and they're up to something. And you can obviously test this with various things, right? So this is Sarah Mohammed. Remember the one with the piece of wheat or whatever it is, fern? Um, Sarah Mohammed, it's a stock photo, right? So if you do a reverse image search, uh, you will find that actually Sarah Mohammed is a stock photo model who models pieces of wheat. Uh, or maybe she's the model and the wheat is the, uh, the star. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> who knows? But you could do a research, uh, reverse image search and it will show you that. Um, that Sarah Mohammed is not the person she's claiming to be. Of course, we, one could argue that, well, it's very normal in certain contexts especially to use images uh, that might be of a flower or something else. Um, but when this happens on scale, uh, it becomes a little suspicious. Let's try another one. This is Yal. If you do a reverse image search of Yal Fadl, remember she was our Cypriot person who believed in education. Um, we found out that her image also was a stock photo. This is a dentist in London. Uh, called the Aqua Dental Clinic. And there she is modeling. I mean, maybe they are all urban professionals who work for NASA and also model in their spare time. Yeah. It's not um, impossible. It's very improbable. OK. But there were hundreds of these accounts, OK? Um, so there was hundreds of these accounts, all with, or say most of them with real photos, um, all of whom had similar biographies. Again, this young urban professional, um, attractive, uh, and they had similar, even if you look at the formatting of their bios, uh, they would have a couple of hashtags in there. They would use, I can't remember what the name of the flat slash it is, um, and it oftentimes would tag, like, tag other accounts in their bios. And this is deliberate because if you tag another account in the bio, it's a way of adding credibility to that profile because you're like, no one who adds an account, a real account in their bio would be lying about it, right? It's again, it's designed to throw people off, right? And you see other anomalies. So I just want to talk about you know, how do we detect these. Obviously, we can do reverse image searches. We can um, look at patterns. We can look at implausible and improbable um, aspects to this kind of community behavior. Um, but one of the, the techniques that I, I sort of adopted several years ago when I was looking into fake accounts was, was using anomaly detection, which is where you can, for example, download a bunch of accounts for example, using the same hashtag, whether COP28 or Dr. Sultan al Jabbar. Um, and within that data, you know, the metadata from the, the Twitter account, so when you download a tweet uh, or, or, or a social media post, you're given a series of bits of information, including the text of the tweet, what the name of the account was that sent it, what application they sent the tweet from, but also things like when the account was created. Okay, and, and these things are essentially important markers, right? So if you, for example, find one hashtag and you found that an unusual amount of accounts tweeting on the same hashtag were all created in a very short space of time, for example, within two weeks, whereas the rest of the accounts in that hashtag were spread out in terms of their creation over a period of 20 years, it's an anomaly. And this has become a very, it's got a community detect, anomaly detect, a community based anomaly detection, where you take large samples of data and find the anomalies within them. And then you have a series of compounding anomalies, which, for example, is the fake photos, the similar bios, that all basically paint this picture, a very clear picture, that these accounts are not what they seem to be. And as a mild digression, this process is endemic. It hasn't changed with Musk. It's got worse with Musk. But we see it all the time. And one of the, I first started discovering this when I was writing about um, uh, the blockade, you know, the Hisar. And I just want to show you an example of it in terms of tweet sequencing. So here's an example from before the World Cup, which I'm sure most of you remember. Do you remember what happened the, very, the day before the World Cup? I mean, firstly, the World Cup here was a massive, uh, there was so much disinformation going around. It was, it, was, it was frightening. But the day before the World Cup, this gentleman here, you might recognize him, some of you, Amjad Taha. He tweeted that the Qatari team, or Qatar rather, had bribed Ecuador to uh, lose the opening game. And they paid Ecuador millions, OK? This tweet, which was, I think, the day before or the morning of that game, went viral. Newspapers from South America to Europe all cited this guy, right? And in his bio, he claims to, to, to own, you know, like run a London Research Center. Um, again, has a verified account, got thousands of followers. And also, if you look recently, I've um, been very active tweeting about Palestine, um, particularly pro-Israeli narratives about Palestine. 
Uh, if many of you might remember a particular tweet where there was a video shot by, I think, two boys on a bicycle that showed um, people who had been killed probably by an Israeli shell or helicopter. And he tweeted immediately, without any sourcing, that this uh, video showed that Hamas snipers were killing civilians. Right, and that tweet went viral as well. It was picked up again. It broke out. It was tweeted in the New York Post and various other outlets. And, and this guy has been tweeting for about five years, right? And I've been, because I've been doing this for a long time, I followed him for a long time. And I've coined even a term for people like him, because there are a lot of people like this now, called disinfluencers, which is routine spreaders of disinflu disinformation, right? So it's an influencer who spreads disinformation. And I've got a whole thread about the various egregious examples of falsehoods that he spread. And um, one of my favorites, I mean, one of the most ridiculous was, you might remember there was an Emirati uh, activist who lived in the UK called Al Al Siddiqui. Uh, she died in a car crash. During the blockade, he claimed that she had been assassinated by Qatar. Uh, and again, he gets thousands of retweets. Um, and he doesn't even own a, a center in London, but he gets cited by news organizations. And, and the, the reason I give this aside is because I want to emphasize the point of this breakout, the point of these dubious accounts online, is that what you say on Twitter does not say on Twitter or Facebook, right? You know, and this guy has been a disinfluencer for five, six years, but it doesn't stop people citing him. Anyway, what I'm showing here, if you look at this, uh, graph here, just as a, an aside, this graph shows every minute the number of times this tweet about the World Cup was retweeted. So every column is essentially a, a number of retweets happening per minute. So you can see that there's lots of retweets happening per minute. The colors, the orange blue, right, they represent the application that the tweet was sent from, retweet was sent from. So for example, uh, blue might be Twitter for iPhone, brown might be Twitter for Android, and orange would be Twitter from the web application from your laptop. And what it can show you is there's a sudden spike in irregularity in tweets coming from a particular platform, again, an indication of manipulation. Uh, and the fact is that th this tweet, which obviously had uh, uh, a kind of, a, it was purposefully uh, false, so disinformation, uh, was being also manipulated in order to algorithmically promote it, to give the sense that it was more important than it was. And remember, this is important, right? Because if one person says a tweet and some, one person retweets it, no one gives a damn, right? 30,000 people say something or retweet it. It's a narrative. It gives it credibility. So how many people retweet it and how fast and how it goes viral matters. Because like I said, one person says anything, you could just ignore that person, right? Um, and so you know, this, these numbers are important. Um, this technique has been used, and I've even studied Donald Trump's timeline. You remember him? Um, you know, uh, during the blockade, uh, his tweets about Qatar were artificially amplified by bots as well. And so, you know, even the former president of the United States' timeline on, on social media uh, didn't have any sort of I I immunity from manipulation because he's using a platform, a commercial platform, by a company. Um, so, quite disturbing. Anyway. One of the questions I was interested in talking about manipulation was, well, how are, tech, how are technologies, how are bad actors adapting to changes both in structures of governance of corporations, but also technological changes? Obviously, now we're all sick of hearing the word AI or GPT, especially if we teach. Um, but this, the question of AI and uh, artificial intelligence has been a really pertinent one when it comes to disinformation, right? So what was very interesting when you track these networks of fake accounts, uh, is seeing how the rise of not just ChatGPT, but in this case, um, you know, image artificially intelligence generating uh, image software, how they use these technologies to basically speed up the creation of accounts. And so, what's interesting about this network tweeting about COP28 is that they were demonstrating that they were reacting quickly to these changes in technology. So all these accounts you see here. Um, you know, Caitlin Summerall from the US, Emma Merrick, uh, Kiraz, are using images generated from Midjourney. So Midjourney has a quite a distinctive tell. Uh, again, you know, here you can also see that they're using the same background photo, right? So bad actors are clearly adopting new technologies, including easily and cheaply accessible AI tools to create and bulk create uh, networks of fake accounts. And what's really interesting about this, before Mid Journey was popular, 
uh, about three years ago now, I think the most popular image generating or facial generating image software was this person does not exist. Uh, com. Has anyone used it? It's kind of incredible. I mean, you basically press refresh, and within a couple of seconds, it will generate a photo of a person that looks incredibly real. I mean, if you see enough of them, you start to, to realize the pattern. But one of the network, and, or at least one of the accounts in this network, used an image. So this is an AI-generated image of a person. But what's funny, if you look at the Twitter account, you, you just see the face. But if you click and download the image, you realize whoever's done it has not removed the watermark from the image. And then you can actually see that it says this person does not exist, dot com, right? So looking at that, I, based on experience, would know that that's an AI-generated image. But when I downloaded it, I was like, OK, that's hilarious. They, they didn't. But you, know, you wouldn't notice it there. So it's kind of absurd. So again, this network was also using AI-generated images to add a level of uh, credibility. And also, AI-generated images, you get AI image detectors. They're not that accurate. Um, but you can't do reverse image search with an AI-generated image. So because unless someone else has, for some reason, used that other image, they're unique, so you can't do reverse image search because reverse image searches re rely on finding an image that already exists. Another interesting aspect about adaptation or how bad actors adapt to technological changes or changes in governance is the verification. Several of these accounts in this network were verified, and here are a few examples of them. Georgia, Sada, Leila, Rebecca. Okay? Rebecca's an Israeli based in Dubai, uh, which is possible now because of normalization. Um, and this is a really interesting thing. I've seen verified accounts before that are fake, but the scale I'm seeing them on now is huge because of what Musk did to X. He, inst he replaced identity-based verification, which involved submitting a passport and being a person of relevance. It was a problematic process because, again, it was fairly elitist, but it still, for the large, most part, depended on you being a real person, or at least you being the person who you claim to be based on identity documents. And he replaced it with a credit-based identification system. Uh, so basically, all you need was a credit card to say, this is my verified account. And now, and we'll see, is these accounts can change their name, they can change their bio, they can change their image. And for a week, their verification becomes pending, but then they just get it back. So there's they're just changing their identities based on the account, but the verification doesn't go away. So there's clearly a huge problem with this verification, um, which means that any person who's got money can essentially pay for verified accounts. And what's more, Musk has introduced the fact that paying for an account means algorithmically you're privileged. It means that your tweets are more likely to be seen than other people who do not pay. So that all that means is people with money, resources, and in this case, ill intentions, can buy influence and credibility. So it's, this is why we have the cynicism now about blue tick accounts, because since Musk took over, we can see that uh, they are being manipulated in, in these other ways. Um, so also, we can, we can generally see by, if we download all the history of these accounts, all their tweets, and we're talking a couple of hundred accounts, and, and then we do a network analysis, which is essentially just seeing who do these accounts interact with. And we can use free software like Gephi. Um, who do they interact with? We can start to build a picture of what the overall modus operandi of the network is, right? Um, because you can see, for example, by looking at one account, maybe they mention the COP28 account. Men maybe they're tweeting at the UN. Maybe they're tweeting about Mohammed bin Zayed. But when we collect them all together and process this computationally, we can sort of get a larger idea. So we can see with this network that the main focus of this network was COP28, UAE, and also Mohammed bin Zayed. Uh, and the fragment of the network that I uh, had was also weirdly focused on Cyprus. Not quite sure why that is, but we can't always have these answers. Um, we can also analyze the network structure. So what I mean by that is you have in a, in a network of accounts you need to try and simulate, because there still are algorithms that attempt to try and remove bots and fake accounts. But as this is demonstrated, these are obviously lacking because bots uh, and fake accounts are proliferating. But what you, you can also analyze is the structure of the network. And what I mean by that is this network has a very particular way of operating. And I would say a hierarchy, like ranks of people, right? So you have like the key accounts, the verified accounts, right? They're the big cheeses, the ones they pay for, you know, the Sarah Mohammed, the Georgia Vassalers, they're the ones who are like the kind of the front end ones. Um, 
And then you have people who aren't verified who might interact with those accounts. And then you have accounts below that who don't even interact with anyone. Their sole purpose is to like accounts above them. Why? Because when you like a tweet, it, again, boosts it algorithmically. But if you have a 1,000 accounts engaging behavior and they're bots, they're more likely to be flagged by the algorithm. So their job is just to retweet or like the accounts above them. And then you have a smaller group of accounts whose job it is to interact. And an even smaller group of accounts that are the sort of blue tick people who will deal with you know, or interact with some of the sort of more influential accounts. Um, a, a slightly simpler way of looking at it would be generals and minions. Um, so the generals are the more significant ones, and the minions are the less significant. But the interesting thing about this is, with, with this network, for example, whilst there was probably a 200, 100 to 200 intermediaries in generals, there was at least 7,000 minions. So 7,000 fake accounts, a large number of which all used AI-generated images for their profile pictures. And just as a kind of a side on the network, this is what this might look like. Here's a tweet from one of the intermediaries. And you can see it's got 109 likes. So that account, Mazen al Hazmi, is here. And it's, these are the accounts we tweet, uh, liking it, right? So you can quite clearly see that these are 109 accounts liking it. Uh, and that's the behavior of those accounts. And this is, you, know, you can also color the edges, the interactions by language. So I can't claim that I had the whole network because it takes quite a lot of time to try and find all the accounts. But you can also color the edges to see what language they're communicating. And the interesting thing about this network, it was in multiple languages, mostly English, also Arabic, but German and Spanish. Um, again, reflects the fact that this network was obviously trying to, uh, to access a large audience. It was trying to ha have an international focus. It was trying to basically portray COP28 in a positive light to as large an audience as possible. Um, and you can use things like, oh, this is funny. So an, an interesting aspect about this was um, if you do some corpus analysis, so essentially take all the tweets and then pop them into a bit of software that will count the frequencies of words and the relationships to words, you can, quite find, you can find interesting things, right? So one of the most commonly occurring words in this thousands and thousands of collective tweets was, unsurprisingly, the UAE. But another one was Turkey, OK? And if anyone knows the past history of politics over the past five or six years, you know there was a lot of animosity between the UAE and Turkey up to a certain point, up to the point where they you know, lit up the Burj Al Khalifa with the Turkish flag. Um, but you can see, just by doing some collocation analysis, that you can, the language used to describe the UAE is, is much more positive. UAE has demonstrated its commitment to, has taken concrete steps to, a proud moment for. Whereas Turkey is no stranger to hypocrisy, is persecuting even the old, is the most dangerous country, right? So you can start to kind of see these clear foreign policy narratives within the text. Um, and again, we can draw out these kind of uh, themes. Um, but another interesting aspect about this network was is talking about uh, cooperation between Israel and the Gulf states and the UAE. Um, but if you, again, apply the kind of analysis I just mentioned, broadly speaking, towards different countries' mentions, you sort of build up a picture of who might be behind it. We've already got some idea because it's promoting COP28. But we can see here, for example, many of the tweets were calling out or criticizing p specific political leaders. Um, the lots criticizing the Turkish presidents. Uh, lots criticizing Hamas, the Iranian government, uh, and migrant working conditions in Qatar, because this was leading up to the World Cup, and that was a big political point. Um, and obviously the Muslim Brotherhood, which we know is another kind of hot topic. So if I was to summarize that particular investigation, it was um, you know, at least 92 fake accounts. There was probably closer to 100 engaged in promoting COP28. Um, and I would argue that that network had success in the sense that people often ask, well, what's the impact of this information? Who reads this? Well, you cannot measure that easily, except sometimes you can when you, for example, see that it's been mentioned in or tweeted, uh, cited in a newspaper. Because what does that mean? Either the editor knows that the person is fake and is just using it anyway, or the editor has been fooled into thinking that's a real person. Right? So those do give us some examples of how these kind of um, forms of manipulation do actually break out into the public sphere. Uh, OK, got a couple of minutes. Um, but another way of a sort of learning about the network and its behaviors is once you write about it. So when I wrote about this, it was written about in The Guardian and various other 
uh, newspapers. And this exposure, one, has to, one wonders if the people running the network are made aware of it. And sure enough, they are. So when that was published in The Guardian, you see, for example, Sarah Mohammed, and this is another tell. Sarah Mohammed becomes Mitch Cohen, right? <laughs> totally different picture, different handle, um, and different bio, still verified, right? So the verification went away for a week, as I mentioned, uh, and then they come back. Uh, some of the accounts were suspended. But again, this goes to show that the integrity of this, uh, the information system and the way the platforms on which we communicate is, is very, very poor. And many of them also deleted the tweets. So the tweets that were focused on in the Guardian article related to COP28 and in particular Sultan al-Jabr. And the accounts deleted many of those tweets. So some of those accounts delete them. Uh, Rebecca Klein then changed to uh, Samantha Ali. Right? And one of the things important to remember is that although you can change your username on Twitter, like the handle here, you will always have a unique user ID. So if you just maintain the database of user IDs and you put it into a system, it will tell you the latest name of that account. Right? And there's other ways to do it, actually. If you often search for the old name just on Twitter, it will show you the new account. Um, but that's another important aspect. And just another level of the size and scale of this network that I think is important to mention is um, sometimes uh, you, you get struck by language. right? So Rebecca Klein's bio was, I'm Rebecca Klein, an Israeli based in Dubai public speaker who promotes global public diplomacy in order to connect more people. Then she transformed into Samantha Ali. Hi, I'm Samantha Ali, an Israeli exploring the power of words to forge global connections, balancing quills and diplomatic skills. She's playing fast and loose with capital letters here, for one thing. But I was really interested by the phrase quills and diplomatic skills. It's quite a nice phrase. So I Googled that phrase because I was like, this is either stolen or well, you know, fair play to, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Although it wasn't in this case. And it led me to a blog on Medium for Samantha Alley. Uh, and I discovered then that this network was not just limited to X, but there was dozens of accounts using Medium to write blogs also about COP COP28. Um, again, the image is a stock photo. Uh, what was interesting is that I was trying to think, had someone stolen a photo of a real Samantha Alley from Medium? But no, because if you go on the Wayback Machine, which is the Internet Archive, you can see that the URL of the original account was called Joey Cooper, not Samantha Alley, and that Joey Cooper had a different image, right? So whoever had updated the X account to, to become Samantha Alley has also updated it from Joey Cooper to become someone else. Um, and these are the kind of headlines, and, and if you search for COP28 on Medium, if you're a person who uses Medium, the majority of the articles about COP28 were produced by fake accounts. So basically, if you use Medium to find about COP28, you're going to be reading propaganda. Um, so here are some of the headlines. Sultan al the Ali, the climate movement needs for COP28. UE Ches meeting approving 78 new environmental projects initiatives for COP28. UA Sustainable Drive leading the way in renewable energy initiatives ahead of COP28. Very positive about COP28. And here are some other examples of those fake accounts on Medium all with quite a few followers for Medium, 1.6 thousand to 1.2 thousand. Again, all using stolen photos. Zachary Weaver. Looks a bit like me, actually. Um, Charlotte Gagnon. Uh, and what was really disturbing, again, in terms of a black mirror, I suppose, to, to, to use the sort of modern metaphor, is the level of <laughs> yeah, fake accounts commenting on posts by fake accounts, right? And what I was saying yesterday is like, if, you, if someone doesn't have a clear identity on social media, don't bother interacting with them. Why should you? Why should you give them your time if you don't know they're real? Uh, another interesting aspect about the content, in addition to COP28, they chimed in with strange narratives about you know, conspiracy theories about Ilhan Omar, uh, COVID-19, uh, and Iran, right? Um, I guess I'll, I mean, I've, I've got other things I can talk to later, but I'll round up then because I think it's a nice point. Um, but, yeah, there was, you know, my summary here is essentially that if you were reading about COP28 on social media and whether it was Medium or Twitter, a large amount of the information you would have been consuming would have been produced by fake accounts. Uh, and we already saw that some of those fake accounts did break out into to, to real media. And it's another important to mind that this Occurrence has happened, again, post-Musk Twitter. And I think that's important because one of the questions that I think is useful to ask is to look at, for example, how changes in governance uh, do impact how influence operations work on social media. I also think the case of X is very important because Musk likes to brag about how he's getting rid of the bots. <laughs> and he's really not. 
Um, and we know that Musk doesn't, you know, is not a bastion of honesty. But, um, you know, I think it's really important to know that verification, credit-based verification, has become a means that can be gamed to promote disinformation and algorithmically privilege that disinformation. And that AI is also being exploited for these uh, malevolent influence networks. Um, and I'm happy to open up to q and I've got more slides, and it might come up in the Q&A, about how this network has now evolved, largely to talk about Sudan, but also Hamas. Um, and my inferred, uh, my opinion based on the content being spread is that it's probably a UAE-connected network. Um, although, again, like anything in this world, it's very hard to prove anything definitively without a smoking gun. You know, I don't have a contract saying this company did this for this ministry to do this. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You still have some, you know, okay, I'm sure. Um, maybe ten minutes if you'd like to talk about Sudan because we haven't mentioned Sudan at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I think is really important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah Shall we do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's um, really important at this point. It's a so I was looking at this network and the reason I, I, I say this connection is because it seems that the some of the accounts who I've identified as part of this network are also tweeting on a lot of other topics. And obviously, for the past year, what's going on in Sudan now, you know, which is, which is horrendous, although it doesn't get that much attention, is also um, arguably a proxy war, right? Um, and what a lot of this network is doing is actually now tweeting and posting pro-RSF, so the Rapid Support Forces, propaganda, right? And in particular, anti Burhan propaganda, so anti-Sudanese armed forces propaganda. So for those who aren't, I mean, I'm not necessarily a Sudan expert, but broadly speaking, uh, the two belligerents would be the Sudanese army and the, uh, the rapid support forces, right? And it's believed that the UE are backing the rapid support forces. Um, and so, again, I just want to show I've been looking at a network of 200 different accounts, approximately, who engage in the same types of behaviors as the previous account, which includes uh, changing their handles. Oh, I don't know what's going on there. OK. So I mentioned how you know, accounts change name, right? So this account here, Cheryl Cody, uh, has now changed to, oh, it's Latif al Sadi, but her, if you look at the handle, Cheryl Kodoy, yeah. This is another common technique. So a lot of these accounts that you see are actually quite old, right? So 2012. That's an old account. But at the same time, the account might only have 200 tweets, which is not a lot of tweets for a really old account. So there's a whole industry and market where people are that sell old accounts. And what they do, they scrub the timeline. So they get rid of all the tweets. They sell it on to a new person who then uses those network of accounts to create fake accounts that issue propaganda. And one of the arguments is, is that algorithmically, Twitter prefers older accounts because it believes those older accounts are more legitimate. Um, and so you have accounts that belie belong to someone called Cheryl Kodoy, uh, adopting an Arab persona, and, and they change the photos. And these are the accounts that you might see when you're just looking at uh, uh, tweets about Sudan, tweeting about uh, the topic. And just as an example of the thing I showed you, I downloaded all the tweets from about 200 different accounts, the majority of which were probably created in about 2010. Uh, but if you put all those tweets into, say, Tableau and look at the time of the tweeting, you'll see that the, the left of this graph is when they started tweet tweeting, which is 2021. So this means that they didn't tweet for eight years, which, again, indicates that all those accounts had been scrubbed. And another interesting thing about this is the blue line is when the account started tweeting about Sudan. And the blue line starts in April 2023. So what this suggests is that the accounts were tweeting since 2021, but when what happened in Sudan started again in 2023. They all became active tweeting about Sudan. Um, and again, if we do a bit of network analysis on those accounts, sorry, it's not very clear, you can actually see that the most, in the previous example I showed you about COP28, the accounts congregated around Mohammed bin Zayed and COP28 account. But here, they are congregating about, around the, uh, the Rapid Support Forces account, right? So their general behavior is to promote the narratives of the Rapid Support Forces. You can just see here two examples of the most uh, retweeted and most interacted with accounts in the network of the sock puppets are uh, pro-RSF accounts. And again, you can do a bit of corpus analysis on all the content produced by these accounts. The, 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 the word that they mention most, for example, is Sudan and Al-Burhan. 
uh, and the, it says, you know, Ikhwan as well, so they also like to talk about the Muslim Brotherhood. And one of the tropes they use, again, if you, if you, if you go through a lot of the content, you can see here, for example, Al-Barnan yuta'awin ma'al nasir al Akhwan. So it's like, the, you know, he's saying, basically, the, the narrative is that Burhan is aligned with the Muslim Brotherhood, and that the Muslim Brotherhood are terrorists, uh, and that uh, uh, Mohammed Hamdan Daglo is like the liberating force and the positive future of Sudan, right? And it's pretty clear when you analyze all those tweets in that way that this narrative is very, very uh, polarized. I don't need to talk more about it, so, but that's the, you get the general idea. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you so much. This was the eye-opening, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> I mean, I'm particularly interested in the disinfluencers. I mean, mm. the disinfluencer you mentioned who's been tweeting for five years. I mean, has he ever appeared in person? Is he a real person? I mean, this is one of the things that I'm sure you asked that question. Yeah, yeah. That's, the, that's always the most important question. Are they real? Because yeah. I've dealt with, in my life, many people who claim to be real who don't actually exist, which is why the tagline for my book is you are being lied to by people that don't exist. But Amjad Taha is a real person, uh, although little is known about him. He's meant to be a British Bahraini. Um, I don't know if he lives in the UK or Bahrain, uh, but he was one of the first people, I think, who went over to Israel after the normalization. Um, and then he posted a bunch of videos of himself, like, you know, talking about how great normalization is. So he's not a very popular figure for obvious reasons. Um, but what's really fa what fascinates me is not necessarily that, I mean, there's, there's loads of grifters out there. It's just the fact that consistently he will tell massive lies, like the one about, you know, you know, Allah Siddiqui being assassinated by Qatar, yeah. or that there being a coup in Qatar in 2021, or the, the, the bribe, is that people, newspapers, pick it up. They're picking it up, yeah. And, and this is the thing, and it's like all you need for that to happen is markers of credibility, which might include... Um, you know, verification, a lot of followers, uh, saying that you own a strategic analysis company in London, uh, but also a lot of engagement. And this is why, manif it's, you know, oh, Chomsky talked about what manufacturing consent, but yeah. this is like manufacturing credibility mm -hmm. through narratives. You know, I think it's like the herd effect, right? If, um, you know, there have been experiments done to show that people, if they believe another particular line or opinion or belief is shared by others, they are more likely to believe it. Yep. I think it was the Milgram experiment, was it? I can't remember. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's disturbing. So um, we, we're now opening to questions. All right, let, let's see where. OK, well, let's start with, yes, Dr. Fadal. Is it working? OK, it's working. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. In fact, I have two questions. Sure. The first one. And maybe because I'm a bit biased, because as political behaviorist, mm. uh, there is always this debate, OK, these things are there, and probably the Emiratis are not the only evil in the place. Everyone is doing it. Mm. And sometimes there is an over-exaggeration exaggeration to what point you know the bad Emiratis against the good others. OK, Russians are doing it. Mm. The Egyptian regime is doing it. And my question, to what extent are the Emiratis the exception? The second thing, my second question is, OK, but uh, sociologists, um, political behaviorists tell us that, that there is also the notion of selectivity bias. Mm -hmm. You know, People can say whatever it is, but I don't follow any one of them. I don't even mm -hmm. know that they are there. Is that really important? if they are fake or what they do to it. Because as a person, I follow people that probably fit more my beliefs. Mm. And this is my question. Yeah. Are they really important to that point to study them and to give them all this power? Because at the end, I follow people who reflect my own points of mm. view. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. My name is Aya Sufan. Um, my question is, um, I think, um, or maybe not then a question. So um, I remember when like uh, some um, newspapers, uh, some TV channels, when they started to pick up uh, news from uh, social media or viral tweets. And like before viral tweets, they had some uh, 
features, stuff like that. But now, with the new changes in Twitter and mm. all of these companies, viral tweet, like before, there were like some kind of trust on viral tweets and stuff like mm. that. But now we can't trust this. My, I feel like people, there should be awareness, uh, especially for uh, news outlets and stuff like that, that if a tweet is viral, that does not mean that it's credible. Mm. So I feel the, the thing is um, there is a lot of changes in social media uh, platforms, but people react with these things the same as 10 years ago, mm -hmm. which is not the same. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I feel like w we have some beliefs about how this social media works, but now everything changes uh, regarding the algorithms, this verification thing, but like we still believe for example, in the, this blue tick that it's verified and stuff like yeah. that. So maybe we need more awareness about these things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's someone online who wants to speak. Uh, Bruno? Yeah, thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bruno. I'm a participant uh, just tuning in online from the UK today. Um, thank you, Mark. That was super interesting. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first, I wanted to ask about the effectiveness of all this that you briefly mentioned. And you said it's very difficult to measure. And uh, I guess this, this makes a lot of sense um, when it comes to newspapers, how it's being picked up, etc. And I was wondering if you saw any or see any measures how to trace and track effectiveness online. Like, what's the engagement? by real accounts that these these campaigns or these fake accounts have. Can we say anything about and how far many or very few genuine users or what you would classify as genuine users engage with that relative to other campaigns where there's less influence um, of misinformation, disinformation, etc. going on. Mm. Um, the other questions I have was, and maybe we can just do this bilaterally later, uh, on the network structure when you built the um, a network of the timelines that you scraped of various accounts, because uh, I also downloaded um, hundreds of the Saudi Watanjis that I'm going to talk about more in detail tomorrow, mm. um, of the Saudi nationalist Twitter networks. And the problem is that many of them got suspended over time. Um, they, they were then created later. They got a new account, etc. So it's it's a very different... Um, timeline when they've been tweeting and I was wondering if that's an issue for building such a network structure um, mm. that you that you explained with the different hierarchies of users because I was yeah I had something similar in mind I was just wasn't really sure how to do it but yeah if you could um, yeah maybe send me a primer how to do this then then sure. I'd be forever grateful thank you sure. thank you okay let's take one more question and then we can um, uh, and then we can uh, just you know, move on someone from this side. Uh, Saif? Um, hello, Omar. Uh, it's, it's good to see you in reality. I, I've always uh, been a follower on, uh, on Twitter for you, and I've always, like, reposting your, uh, your, uh, your work on, on Twitter, and your fights, too, with, uh, <laughs> with some of the UAE-based uh, academics. And I don't want to mention names now, <laughs> today. <laughs> Uh, and my, my question is, uh, is a straightforward to the point. Uh, are there any limitations uh, to, uh, to, to this uh, uh, account so the, the, they can reach uh, points and they cannot reach others? So, uh, uh, for example, you say that they are all generated or, uh, you know, AI generated or, or they are organized some way uh, systematically, mm -hmm. but uh, they are, there is no human behind every account. Uh, so what are their limitations? Uh, and uh, do you think that the, the uh, multinational corporations such as Meta, Twitter, or X now, mm -hmm. and, and other, uh, LinkedIn for sure, uh, Instagram and others, so the, the, the want to work uh, to limit this or to take it down. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. Uh, would you like to take those questions yeah. first? OK. Sure. Wonderful. Uh, you yeah. go ahead. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. All, yeah, all excellent. And I'll start. I'll, try, I'll just do them in order. But firstly, the, the question on who's doing this and everyone's doing this and how do we quantify that? A really important question, right? Uh, I think it depends. 
and, and I do this. So in my book, I, I make a specific argument. I, I use the term digital media power, which is to what extent do certain entities have the resources to generate or, or use digital, or even willingness to use digital technology for particular illiberal practices, right? That's one thing. But how then do we measure that? Right, there's certain things that you could do. If you're looking at a state, you might look, for example, at the digital infrastructure, the technological penetration rates, how many people have a mobile phone, how many people have access to social media, how many people use it. Those things are relatively uh, good starting points. But I think for this, the way I sort of try to go about uh, quantifying it in, in sometimes more quantitative but others qualitative ways is firstly, to what extent do we know from what's going on in the public sphere how certain actors are behaving, right? So, for example, during the past five years, I mean, the blockade was an interesting case study, which is when I started looking at bots, because you had a particular political action by four countries, you know, a sort of surprise attack, as it were, uh, that had prepared, for example, a series of digital techniques to doing it. So in that case, you could see that there was, like, an online army ready, right? And that played out in the data. You can look to other sources. So before Musk took over Twitter and uh, you know made it about him, there was uh, Twitter were, were were publishing, for example, uh, accounts, lists of accounts and tweets that were linked to state-backed influence operations. Now I, I'm the first person, and I was always being critical of Twitter, say this was not comprehensive. But what they would do, they would list these accounts based on uh, country, what country they connected to, and actually they would you know you'd had all sorts of countries there: Serbia, Morocco. Uh, Iran, China, uh, and I generally ask my students, well, what do you think the highest, which country do you think has the highest number of accounts connected to state-backed influence operations? And most people say Russia or China. Actually, I think it was China. But in, numbers, in second place was the UAE and Saudi, right? And uh, one of the reasons for that is when they did the, they didn't always separate Saudi and UAE. So one of the batches was Saudi, UAE, Egypt, Bahrain, like the blockading countries, which goes to show, again, there was a link between the political crisis in the Hisar and influence operations. But that is just one way you might start to try and quantify some of these behaviors, right? And it's like anything. Of course, everyone is doing it, just like every country has an army. But not every country has the same resources. And I think we have to think about digital influence campaigns in the same way. I mean, we often talk about Russia, China. We should talk about the US as well and Israel. But because of a, a lot of the stuff on influence operations and disinformation, it has this kind of um, Atlant you know, sort of transatlantic security concern bias, right? where it's always like, well, we're, we don't do disinformation, we just do messaging. Uh, and I've been in meetings where people say, how do we curb Russian influence in Africa? They're like, well, we just do our own messaging and make it more. And, and, and you know, it's like, this it's like this unwillingness to accept that everyone does disinformation. So, you know, like you look on Twitter, there won't be any US connected disinformation campaigns or Israel disinformation connected campaigns from this database. It doesn't mean they don't exist, but it's a starting point in terms of analyzing information. And, you know, just um, in terms of the content that I've come across on particular platforms, there is just more that, you know, if you look at the narratives, if you find, for example, here's a batch of fake accounts, I'm not interested in who, who, who is behind them. But if I look at the narratives they're putting out, you can then analyze based on narratives and which narratives are stronger. Um, so, yeah, the, that's one way of doing it. In terms of the kind of, yeah, the biases, I mean, this, I think this question will pervade everything we discuss, you know, what does it matter, who's, if, you know, if I follow people who I already agree with, then, you know, then what's the relevance? Well, I mean, there's relevance in other ways. I mean, is it about people, you know, having these accounts that confirm their own bias? That's its own problem, right? It shouldn't just be from the perspective of how should this, you know, affect someone who has a different opinion. Um, but I do think some of the, the question also alluded to this notion, and others have asked, is the impact. And I'll, maybe I'll address the question that Bruno is. What's the well, one is what the impact is? Well, it's, again, I said it's hard to measure. Um, but at the same time, it's, for me, important to measure. Because I, for example, here highlighted a bunch of fake accounts. That doesn't mean they're all the fake accounts. How do you know like you're not being influenced by people who might not be real? And most of in this room go like, I would never be that stupid, which is true. Probably most of us wouldn't. But I, just as an example that I, I will mention, you know, in, 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 in 2020, I worked with a journalist from the Daily Beast, and we found one of the most egregious examples of manipulation that also involves social media that I've ever seen. And it's, 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 it's hard to believe, but we found... 120 op-eds, articles in 
uh, 46 different news outlets. Sorry, could, could I put the, uh, the, the, yeah, thanks. We found 120 different op-eds, right, written in 46 different news article uh, outlets. Oh. Yeah, OK. Is it possible to get on this one? Oh, you can see this one. So just look to the side, guys. Um, you, you, um, including New Europe, uh, New Europe, Asia Times, Fair Observe, the National Interest, Newsmax, you know, across the world, right? These, these outlets published articles by people. This guy here, Rafael Badani, he's not Rafael Badani. He's a guy from Bar called Barry Dadon from California. Someone stole his photo, right, from his wife's Facebook page and then used it to write articles. This guy wrote a dozen articles or so, right? Um, and then this network used stolen photos and AI-generated images to basically fool over 46 different editors into publishing their op-eds, right? And the way they fooled them is by creating a backstory of social media accounts. They had LinkedIn and Facebook accounts. And you know what the editors didn't do that they could have done? They didn't pick up the phone <laughs> they, and call them. Yeah, absolutely. But actually, video call. Because, yeah. yeah. Because if they had video called them, they would at least know one thing, that the people they were speaking to were not the same people in the photos. And this ties in with the question you were asking about relevance, is that where does this end? Because we've been talking about fake news. It was, what, the word of the year in 2016? We've been talking about it for so long, and people who should know about it, and I know, you know journalists and editors and, you know, were all involved some way probably face a lot of pressures, but the people who are at the vanguard or at least at the forefront and in the way the gatekeepers what we know were fooled by this. So if we sit here thinking, I would never be fooled by this, we're perhaps you know, giving, not giving ourselves too much credit, but we underestimate how uh, deceptive other people can be. So I, I think that's important. And hopefully that ties a little with what you were saying about we need to teach people about this. And I think this is one of the important things to me is this is a media literacy thing. Regardless of whether you think you'll be influenced or not, um, I think it's very important for people to understand that the narratives and the information that they see on social media uh, are or may be manipulated. And this could include algorithms. You know, the fact that you have 2,000 bots retweeting something will mean that whatever they're retweeting, even if you don't see a specific tweet, the content of that, the topic, will be more salient, right? So they'll be exposed to something that they wouldn't have been exposed to because someone is m manipulating a bot network that wants them to, to know about that. So all these, to me, I think are important in building crit critical digital literacy because like any phenomena, I mean, we're academics, most of us. Right? Some of the things we're interested in, whether it's, you know, like, I don't know, 15th century literature, aren't going to be for everyone's taste. <laughs> but, you know, like, whether you argue there's an academic interest is one thing. I think there's always an academic interest in pursuing interesting questions, but I do also think there's a broader point to be made here about media literacy that is relevant to everybody. Um, Bruno, had yeah. Bruno had another question about network structures. Yes, so, yeah, I was just getting to that one, yeah. It's a really important point, and, and one of the things I said, the fragment of the network, because I think, one, unless you can find archived work of those suspended accounts, you're not really going to get them. So you have to kind of d make do with the data you can, and I think you just need to qualify it when you talk about your methods, about the potential limitations of maybe not having the whole network. I mean, I mentioned here that there was a bit of a focus on Cyprus. I don't think that's because the network is largely focused on Cyprus. I think that means some of the network, because I've been looking at similar networks over time, has been taken down, and that I just don't have access to the whole network, so I can't get a full comprehensive picture of what it writes about. Um, so I think it's always important to mention those things. Um, and yeah, I think I addressed the, the impact of this, but there was Safe's question, yeah, which is about, yeah, the, the, I'll, I'll, the technicalities. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's been one or two examples of people who've like raided a troll, not raided a troll farm, like a journalist who's been allowed into one of these places where you have people operating these kind of campaigns. Um, but essentially, the division of labor I mentioned would also be a div division of labor in terms of technique. So all the bots would likely be on an automated system. So for example, I have 2,000 bots in you know, a macro or probably a database of some description, and I drop in a link that I want them to retweet, and it's already programmed to stagger the retweeting so it doesn't retweet it all at the same time. That would be done automatically. And it's pretty easy to create a bot, or it was. I mean, I once created an anti-sectarian hate speech bot that would just automatically reply to people engaging in sectarian hate speech with a simple response. Um, but I would say that the, the, the higher up, the intermediate, the generals, they will be a group of people who operate those accounts. But you, you don't need many. I mean, you could say one person could, if you're doing this full time, one person could have 10 or 20 accounts that they operate. And if you're doing it nine to five, uh, I can't remember what the rate limits are on tweets. It used to be 2,000. 
But you could retweet or tweet 2,000 tweets per account. Say you're running 10 accounts with 20,000 you know, times, or double that, 40,000 tweets per day, and that's one person. Right, so this, the, the potential damage one person could do, I think those figures need updating, but the point is, is that one person could write a lot if that was their full-time job. And again, there's also an aspect of digital labor that's really interesting. You know, one of the arguments I, I made recently was, was talking about um, what's going on in, 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 in Palestine and how at the beginning of, of soon after October 7th, there was loads of like uh, tweets about Gaza coming from Indian accounts, right? And there's this, there's, there's a whole book written about, you know, the BJP cells, the IT cells of people who, who engage in tweeting on behalf of like, you know, Modi. And, and I always think, well, the, there's, there's places where you could really, uh, if you set up like a, a, a troll factory or a bot factory, you could pay people relatively low amounts of money to actually then engage in this form of deception. I mean, even in the Gulf states ourselves, where you have such a hierarchy of labor and division of labor and massive variation in pay scales, you know, if you paid someone 1,500 Qatari reals a month, you know, that's what some people earn. Imagine if their job was to actually just engage in this kind of thing. All these things are possible with the technology as it is. All right, let's take another round of questions. Um, Dr. Fedi, Fadel? Wait, yeah. Yeah. Okay. First question has to do with um, the memory. Uh, so these accounts, these fake accounts, are removed, uh, some of them at least, and that takes away uh, part of the narrative, which which is the the fake account narrative. What these fake accounts had to say and mm. how big they were, how interconnected they were. Um, it takes it away from the users, from us, but the companies, the corporates, uh, the fake account uh, producers still have that narrative. There, there is a, some kind of imbalance there. Mm. Uh, how do you compensate for that when, uh, when, when you re re restructure the story? The other thing is, I mean, we talk about these fake accounts as if they are always the villain or the, the evil. Mm. But like we know, Hassan Kanafani, he wrote, he used fake names to criticize, uh, uh, what's the, I forgot the, the, the name he used. Uh, it's a repetition of a name, and there is a book with that. Mm. Many critiques in, in authoritarian regimes find um, a good place to use other, other names or fake names, and they publish, even in newspapers, in, uh, and, and we think this is fine. Um, V for Vendetta basically made that a, a, a good thing to do, right? Yeah. We, we now have Anonymous uh, standing out or standing up for, for causes across the world. So that's also a, another story, right? Uh, it's, it's not always bad to mm. create fake accounts. Yeah. So how, how do you uh, distinguish between, between these two? Fadel? Um, You'll go first, and then you. OK. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I am Hussam, master's student in, uh, at DI. Uh, I believe that uh, these networks, like uh, international company, have agency. And the local agency here is the uh, Emirates. I, I wondered about what the main interest of this country to bring all this country at, at the same time. Uh, and, and I see here, in some, in some times we see it, uh, Emirates, Ethiopia, uh, against uh, Sudan. Other time we see Egypt, Emirates, uh, against, uh, and sometimes KSA against Qatar. What the main interest of this country to do what they do? Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks so much. I always learn so much from you. Um, and I have a question. I, I don't know if I'm, uh, but for example, because you, you mentioned that that it's a very, the verification system has had boost in this, all of these phenomena. But I'm also wondering another amazing new feature <laughs> in Twitter in X, sorry, which is the warning label systems. Mm. Have you seen an interaction between? Because I've seen some studies saying or suggesting that. Uh, the warning labels, the X warning labels, might also, you know, help spread disinformation or misinformation because it's 
it's just a certain amount of people who are you know participating in this community and who decides mm. have you seen any kind of overlap between both or i'm just making things up no <laughs> no okay is there anyone from this side uh uh dr charles uh, hi, Mark. This is Charles. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You seem to be following, uh, or you seem to have followed a specific network um, mm. over three years, yeah. regardless of you know change of names, but the user ID is yeah. there. I'm wondering if you have any insights about uh, network behavior, um, mm. so engagement with others, uh, homogeneous, mm. um, how does it change over time? Uh, or other kind of information about how it has evolved over that period. Thank you. Right. Uh, we'll take Dr. Ahmed. You had a question. I actually have many, so I'm oh. not sure I, there we'll is time. We'll stick to one this time. One. Okay. That's sad, <laughs> but I hope you'll stay afterwards. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, if it is one, I'll probably talk about the concept of this influencer. I really love it. Mm. I actually used it once, mm. uh, but I wonder whether it could be used as a spectrum. Uh, why? Mm. Because if you say someone is a disinfluencer, you just like fix that person into one category. Elon yeah. Musk, for in my mind, is a disinfluencer. Mm. But sometimes he says, like, he would just uh, tweet facts about right. his ex space, whatever, Tesla, whatever he's promoting, right? Mm. So it's not only um, exclusively misinformation or disinformation, it could also be facts or just mm. general blah, blah, blah. So I wonder whether it could be like a spectrum where you can measure this in a way. I, I'm, again, just to develop that conceptualization, I love it. It could be a title of a book. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right. Would you like to take those? Uh, sure. Yeah. There are five of them. Yeah. So uh, again, I'll, I think I'll go in order. Uh, and, and Fadi's question, I think, ties in with some of the other questions about, in, I say, incomplete data. And this is something, I mean, as you said, of course, maybe the companies have that. Maybe there's, I love, to, I love the idea that one person might be behind all this and have their own archive that we could raid one day. But um, yeah, I think there's always going to be that limitation that we'll never have a comprehensive picture of what these networks do. And, I, and that's also relevant because some of these networks are probably for hire. So they won't necessarily have one ideological leaning, right? You could rent out these bot networks to someone one day who's tweeting about, you know, BTS or Justin Bieber and the next that they could be tweeting about Iran, right? They, they might not have a particular ideology. So that insight, if you knew that about a network, you might, it might be able to tell you something that it's just a network for hire, right? There's no ideology. Um, but at the same time, I do think that when you have a certain amount of accounts engaging the same be behavior, we just have to think, well, what questions are we interested in ask asking? The question here would be the network as it is now that is identifiable is putting out this particular narrative, if it exists. Uh, and I think that's why we always have to be careful with how we frame our questions and, and mention, again, the limitations of the data we don't have, right? Because the data we don't have is always important, especially in digital technology. This is why we have algorithmic bias and racist data, because it hasn't been trained, for example, on uh, comprehensive. So I think we always need to be mindful of that, and it's really important. Um, I think in terms of good and bad, I mean, of course, I, no, I mean, I'm not saying anonymity, for example, is bad or pseudonyms are bad. I mean, sometimes this is really important. Uh, but I think I remember about 15 years ago, one of the arguments about, um, I remember there was a fake journalist called Lillian Khalil who was writing about Bahrain. And then I, I kind of wrote about that. And then the Washington Post said, well, should we care about this? Because we need anonymity in the Arab Uprisings. Of course, no one's saying that anonymity is not pro a problem. But at the same time, anonymity can also be weaponized. Uh, and that's an important thing. And I think when it comes to selecting the research we do, and this is where axiology or our perception of ethics and morality comes in. Like I could see, for example, if I'm looking at now, I probably would divert more of my attention to looking at uh, pro-Israeli manipulation than I would pro-Palestine manipulation. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? It just means that, you know, I don't, I believe that Israel is an occupying force, and on a moral position, I'm going to devote more of my resources as an academic to exploring that particular angle. Um, so I think whether we like it or not, we often make these choices, and it doesn't mean manipulation isn't, or people using fake identities isn't happening everything. But we can be clear about those choices, and I don't think that's, that's necessarily a problem. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely not saying that these can't, things can be bad. And even if we don't want to take any sort of moral position, we can be entirely descriptive, right? You know, I think one of the interesting things when I wrote, for example, you know, obviously being someone who's 
an academic but also an activist, when I wrote about what was going on in Iran with the Masa Amini hashtag, and I wrote that this is the biggest example of exploit, you know, manipulation of Twitter data. I think lots of people got angry, you know, a lot of my friends who are activists, because it was like, well, this is going to be propaganda for the Iran regime, regardless of what you think about the politics. Of course, they're right. That will be used as that. So what do I, what do, I do as a researcher? Do I not talk about that? Do I minimize that? Because they were basically arguing, well, this level of manipulation might, one, be a good thing because it's promoting a particular narrative. And two, if you actually write about it, it's going to look bad because it will look like, you know, there's propaganda. Yeah. Right. So th these kind of dilemmas are, are par for the course. And you, it's, it's sometimes hard to know what to do. But I would say, generally speaking, you know, that's where the kind of an ethical choice might have to come in. Um, oh, yeah, there's a question from Jen. Yeah, there was something about why they do it. Yeah. yeah. Labor feature, I don't know, <laughs> uh, is the short answer. So I'm sorry I can't add more to that. Um, I think the question is why, why they do it is an interesting one. I mean, there's, there's a number of reasons. Is, you know, why does anyone engage in any form of messaging? You know, these are big questions, right? Like, why do we have media is about one informant. And I think it ties in with that very premise, the idea of trying to inform people what's going on, trying to uh, influence people ideologically. It all comes down to that. It's an attempt to influence people's perspectives on a certain situation or conflict or war or domestic policy. Whether that's effective or not is a different question. But I think that's the motivation. It comes fundamentally down to messaging and why we do it. And, and I think some, I, I also think, you know, personal choice. I think some people believe, you know, one of the arguments I make about digital superpowers in, for example, Saudi and UE, is that individuals might have a lot of influence. And I think, for example, in the case of Saudi, we know Saud al-Qahdani, his role, I think he was someone who really pushed for the importance of digital media. He believed that the digital frontier, social media, was going to be an important front. And therefore, he lobbied for that to be an important priority in terms of the information space, which is why you have stories like you know, Saudi moles infiltrating Twitter headquarters and trying to find information on anonymous accounts right, being sent back. Because there was a clear perception, or the threat perception, that social media was relevant. If you have a, a government where no one really cares about social media, you're probably not going to see those kind of campaigns. But at the same time, you also have, you know, and I use the examples of Bell Potting and the Western companies who go around, you know, people in nice suits from Mayfair pitching their services. Hey, man, we can do you a campaign. We can get the World Cup canceled in Qatar. I mean, this happened, right? Mm -hmm. And some people will think, oh, that's a cool product. Let's buy it. But, you know, it's like a bit like snake oil salesmen. Maybe these campaigns are actually meaningless. Maybe they're effective. But some people will think they're worth buying. Um, so there's loads of different elements to this that I think are interesting. Network behavior, yeah, it's a really interesting one, actually. I think I can't look at a three-year network change, but I certainly see a longer trajectory of how generally fake accounts tend to operate. I would say with the this network that they've increased in terms of cautious, cautious behavior. And what I mean by that is I think a lot of their behavior demonstrates that they're a bit unwilling to rock the boat. So they do interact with people. Like, for example, you're tweeting about COP28. They might reply to you. Yeah. But what I would say is, like, three years ago, they would have, more accounts would have been more likely to reply to you and engage directly than they are now. I think this network structure that I mentioned is that they have fewer people engaging in those direct engagement roles and more people just engaging the promotion role because I think maybe they see engagement as a form of, it's a flag, if some reason, more flag. That's my hypothesis. I don't know how true it is. Um, but interestingly, I've seen my friends or colleagues interacting with some of these accounts that I know are fake, uh, which I think is quite interesting. You know, when we, we're just going back to this notion of inf effectiveness, you know. Um, so some people think they're real. Um, in the spectrum, right? The yes. Ahmed's question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah OK. Uh, but yeah, I, just, uh, I do think it's a spectrum. And I, I don't use the term lightly, but I will say when we label anyone, ourselves included, we have multiple identities, whether it's a teacher, father, cat lover, in my case, <laughs> coffee lover. You know, and, and those identities become more or less salient. Just because someone's a disinfluencer, it doesn't negate their other identities, right? Uh, and I think the threshold for determining that should, should be quite high. And I do think there is. is is, is a line. The reason I use it for someone like uh, Amjad Taha is because not only do they engage in a form of behavior where periodically they will say, not just like a lie, but something that is clearly strategic, yeah, the, the false and like egregiously false, is that it's done in such a way that I would say there's other evidence to suggest that that person is also engaging in particularly politicized narratives, right? So I think there's more to it than that. And even the nature of the facts, his tweets are being manipulated by other bots would suggest that there is 
a substantial amount of effort being put into this disinfluence, if that makes sense. Um, so I don't think it negates the other, but I do think there needs to be a spectrum and some sort of threshold. And I think you need to rise to a certain level of prominence before it becomes more relevant. But I would agree with you about Elon Musk being one. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll have to end it now, unfortunately. This is, has been a spectacular uh, mm -hmm. session. Thank you so much. Please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Mark. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. So there's a coffee break until 1130. And then we're back again. Thank you.